Hey guys, welcome back. And today we are learning about the skull. The skull is actually a very, very fascinating piece of structures in the human body. And lo and behold, there are 22 bones making up the skull. <laughs> and you're going to learn all of them. And not just what these 22 bones are, but how they function in the body and what their features are. So one of the fun things about learning anatomy is you get to learn all the little bumps and holes and all the grooves and all that kind of stuff. So that's the fun of learning anatomy. Now, you might not think it's fun right now, but you will. You'll be so proud of yourself by the end. You'll pat yourselves on the shoulder. So we're going to make extensive use of the AP Revealed software because that software is just an awesome study tool for learning all the bones of the body and the muscles and everything else but including the skull. So the skull by itself is half the battle. Once you've learned all the bones and features of the skull, the rest is actually a lot easier. So we're going to spend this entire lecture just on the noggin here, just on the skull. So I'm going to lower my video here and we're going to go to AP Revealed and we're going to play around with it. And so let's see what happens. Now we're going to look at the skull from all different angles, inside and outside, because one of the things you'll need to learn to do is not just memorize the names of the bones, be, be able to recognize where they are no matter what angle you're looking from. And so this is, this is part of your anatomical challenge in this class. So we're going to start with the front, the anterior aspect of the skull. And we're going to look from the lateral, the posterior. We're going to take off the cranial cap, look from the superior view take off the mandible and look from the inferior view. So we are going to tear this baby apart. Does that sound okay with you? Yes, that sounds okay. He's missing a few teeth. It's pirate. So notice that here on AP Revealed, we're looking at the anterior view. And you'll notice that this is stuck all these like pink and blue colors here. That's to help you learn the origin and, and insertion points of muscles. So we'll get to the muscle system later. Um, but it's always kind of helpful to study the skeletal system and the muscular system in conjunction because they work together. I mean, ultimately, one of the main functions of, of bones are to serve as attachment points for muscles. You know, like, I mean, your jaw doesn't just drop by itself. There's muscles uh, that'll drop it down. And so if you look on this on the skull here, you'll see that we have uh, in blue, these are areas where muscles would attach and in red or pink here are areas where muscles would be coming out of this area to attach somewhere else. So those are called the origins. So nice big origins on the side of your skull here. You know, that's going to help with this chewing. <laughs> so we'll get to that later. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to pull those muscle insertion and origin points off. And I can do that just by sliding it down. <gasps> and they're gone. How cool is that? <laughs> okay. Um, Let's just look at the main parts of the skull here. So we actually have some regions to the skull. The jaw portion here is called the mandible. So that's your mandible. And because this mandible doesn't want to stay here, there's a little screw here, this doesn't want to stay on the skull, I'm going to pull it off for a minute just to make it easier. And so now we're looking at the rest of the skull here. Um, so we have two main regions to the skull. So if I stick this lower jaw right back on here. Um, and so we have uh, the facial region, which is basically all the bones that make up the face. So that includes the mandible. So this is the facial region right here. Um, this lower jaw, this is the only part that's kind of separate from the rest of the skull. This is called the mandible. And this mandible doesn't want to stay on here, so I'm going to move it right now. The rest of the bones made up of eight bones are making up what's called the cranial region. Um, and if you were to actually take off the top of the skull, this is called the cranial cap, and that allows you to see what's on the inside. So we're going to go over all these different bones right here. All these bones are what we call fused bones. They're joined together really, really closely with just little lines in between them called sutures. And I don't know if you can see that in the camera, but I'll show you in a little bit on AP Revealed. And so uh, the interesting thing is when babies are born or when they're developing, um, these sutures haven't closed up altogether yet. And so there's still some cartilage region. So like, you know, when you touch a baby's head, they have a soft spot because these sutures haven't, haven't completely closed. 
But the sutures are basically, it's kind of like, like stitches, almost like oh, stitches on a, that you would do on a sewing machine. So, of course, each of those sutures has a name that you'll be learning because that makes it fun. Uh, anyway, so every little depression, every little thing on the skeleton it has a name, and that really helps clinical practitioners know exactly where they're talking about when they're diagnosing somebody. So anyway, so let's uh, take a look at some of these main bones. So first of all, everybody go like this to your forehead. So what you're touching here is called your frontal bone. So let's see if we can pull this down and uh, look at the frontal bones. Okay, so if I turn on my layers here, notice that right there um, highlighted is the frontal bone. And if you can see here, there's a suture line right there that kind of separates the frontal bone from the other bones. And uh, this covers your brow ridge, you know, all that area there. Um, and of course, it has features that we'll be examining in a minute. I'm just kind of giving you a brief overview at first. Now, uh, take your hands, go boop, 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 boop. If you do that, you are looking at your parietal bone. So let's go down here to your parietal bone. Okay, so looking from the anterior view here, you don't see very much of it. So it's here and it's here, but looking at the rest of the view, whoosh, whoosh. so if I went here to a lateral view, that's where you're going to see most of the parietal bones. So if I go down here to the parietal bones, turn on my layers, boop, there is a parietal bone right there, parietal bone. Moving on to the back, so if I go to the posterior area here, and I select the occipital bone, Do -do -do. and now you got to get this in just the right place there. Okay, so here is your occipital bone in the back, and you can see that there is a suture line going that way. So you might remember occipital, right, when we were going over regions, body regions of the head. Remember the occipital region, remember the frontal region. So a lot of times, remember I said learn the names of those regions, because a lot of the times those will give you clues into the names of the bones that make those regions up. Ah, so you can't just forget stuff after the end of a unit. You actually have to retain the information to make your own life easier. All right. Um, so, and then there's lots of little bones um, making up the, it's called the orbit, the eye hole and the nasal cavity, and et cetera. I mean, look how crazy it gets when you look at the inferior view of the skull. So we're going to get into all that. Let's watch a little overview of the skull. So again, eight bones making up the cranial region, 14 bones making up the facial region. Those add up to 22 bones of the skull. So I'm going to go over here to the film, and we're going to watch a little film. The human skull is made up of eight cranial bones that surround and protect the brain, and 14 facial bones that form the underlying structure of the face and support for the teeth. With the exception of the mandible, the bones of the skull articulate with each other through joints known as sutures. Throughout the skull, holes known as foramina serve as passageways for blood vessels and nerves. Bones on the surface of the skull encase the brain, protect sensory organs, and serve as attachment sites for the muscles of the head and neck. These bones include the occipital bone, parietal bones, temporal bones, and the frontal bone, as well as the nasal bones, the zygomatic bones, the maxilla, and the mandible. Other bones become more visible only when looking inside the skull. The sphenoid bone makes up the anterior base of the cranium, it is a butterfly-shaped bone with a central body and two pair of laterally projecting wings. These wings form portions of the orbit. The body of the sphenoid features a depression known as the cella turcica, which houses the pituitary gland. Located between the orbits, the ethmoid bone makes up a portion of the cranial floor and also the roof of the nasal cavity. An inferior projection, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, forms part of the nasal septum, 
The crista galli projects superiorly from the ethmoid bone and serves as the attachment point for the falx cerebri, a dural fold. Extending laterally from the crista galli is the cribriform plate, a perforated area through which the olfactory nerves pass. The two L-shaped palatine bones form the posterior third of the hard palate, part of the nasal cavity, and a portion of the orbit. The small, thin lacrimal bones make up the anterior portion of the medial wall of each orbit. A groove known as the lacrimal groove helps to form the nasolacrimal canal, which contains a duct that allows tears to travel to the nasal cavity. The vomer is an elongated, plow-shaped bone that forms the inferior and posterior part of the nasal septum. The internal and external skull bones articulate precisely, forming an intricate structure perfectly suited to its functions. Okay, so you have a general overview there. Now, you're probably like, okay, it's everything's okay going over those, those eight cranial bones, but things get kind of crazy when you go over some of those facial bones, like the sphenoid and the ethmoid bones. I mean, those guys, first of all, ethmoid and sphenoid, you can only see parts of them from the outside. You really get into the nitty-gritty of them inside of the skull. And they have all sorts of little features, little projections and grooves and all sorts of things. All of those have names. So don't worry about that part yet. Uh, the cella tersica, which is one of my favorite features of the whole skeletal system, you'll be learning all that. But let's um, focus on the main cranial bones first. And I forgot to mention, you guys didn't remind me out there in cyberspace, that while I mentioned the frontal bone and the parietal bones and the occipital bone, I forgot the temporal bones. Duh. The temporal bone is on the side. That's where your ear goes. So like here's a little hole. Um, that's your external acoustic meatus where your ear hole is. And that's part of this larger bone called the temporal bone. So anytime you hear temporal, tympatic, that that kind of hints at sound or vibration because that's what our ears do, right? They're, they're for sound. And there's a temporal bone on this side as well. So, sorry, forgot to mention that part. So we got temporal, parietal, occipital, and frontal. So you guys will be able to remember the temporal bones now because you'll be like, ah, that's the one she forgot to mention, right? So let's go back to our uh, dissected view here. And we're going to take this baby from all different angles. So let's go ahead and, while we're on it, start with the posterior view of the skull. Okay, so we're looking, let's just call this guy um, Charles. Okay, so we're going to look at Charles's head here. So let's look at the back here. We're looking at the occipital region, which consists of the occipital bone. Now there is an important feature. That means one of those little things, a, a bump or a hole or a groove or a depression um, that we're going to look at here and that's this little bump which you can actually palpate you can feel it in the back of your head you'll feel that there's a little bump back there and that bump has a name so what we're going to do with this posterior view here is we're going to turn on the tags so that we can actually so if i bring this down and turn this on now i got little pegs here that will help us to learn all these different parts. So, do you guys remember the occipital bone? It's going to be outlined by this suture right here, and uh, we can highlight that suture. So, if I click that peg, um, this is a suture called the lambdoid suture. Let's pronounce that. Lambdoid, lambdoid suture. suture. Say lambdoid suture. It's like a lamb. That's doid. It's a lambdoid suture. Okay, so that's the lambdoid suture, and that is what allows the occipital bone to attach to the parietal bones out here. So highlight our parietal bones. There they are. So there are our two parietal bones. And notice these parietal bones not only meet up with the occipital bone, bone at the lamboid suture, but they also meet with each other at the sagittal suture. So the sagittal suture, sagittal suture. is the suture that joins the two parietal bones together. So going back to Charles here, here is his sagittal suture. Here's a parietal bone, and here's a parietal bone, and they join at the sagittal suture. And then in the back, in the posterior side, on the 
bottom of those bones, they join to the occipital bone via the lambdoid suture. It's lambdoid suture. Okay? So let's say sagittal suture, parietal bones, lambdoid suture, and this, of course, down here is our occipital bone right there. Now, we still have those temporal bones, right? And you can only see a little bit of the temporal bones from the posterior view. So there's a little bit of the temporal bone. So from the back, you're really only seeing this little part right there and right there. To see the rest of the bone, you would have to rotate the skull to the lateral aspect. Now, one of the ways to help you learn these things is try to memorize, and I hate the term memorize, but in anatomy, we got to do some of that. Try to memorize what bones you can see from what aspect, from what perspective. And that will help you in trying to identify them because you're looking, you're like, okay, what should I be able to see from this angle? And if you remember that, then you could, then it's just process of elimination, right? Okay, so let's do it again. We got parietal and occipital. And then joining those guys, we have the lambdoid suture and the sagittal suture. Okay, so sagittal suture, and you can come over here and read all about it. Lambdoid suture. Okay, so lambdoid suture is the joint between the parietal and occipital bones. Sagittal suture is the joint between the parietal bones. Parietal bones, occipital bones, and a little bit over here, the temporal bones. Now, there's another peg on here. You're like, what is that? So remember I told you that bump. So everybody feel the bump on your occipital bone in the back. It's right here. That little feature is called the external occipital protuberance. External occipital protuberance. External occipital protuberance. Well, external because it's on the outside. You can feel it. Occipital, because it's in your occipital region on your occipital bone. Protuberance. Now, protuberance is something to know, that word, because just like we saw with anatomical regions and directions, anatomy uses the same words over and over and over again. So features, that means bumps, grooves, depressions, shallow areas, holes, all these features of the bones are in little categories. And if you remember the names of those categories, that will help you to learn the names of these features. So a protuberance is, think of the word protruding. It's, it's a little bump. It's something that protrudes out of the rest of the bone. So this is a protuberance, external occipital protuberance. And these features, you know, you're like, why do we have to learn all these features? Well, they all have functions for the body. And if you didn't have them, it would affect the function. So you can see that the protuberance, the external occipital protuberance, provides attachment for a ligament called the neutral ligament. And you'll run into that word neutral again as well. So you remember what a ligament is. It's connective tissue that attaches bone to muscle. And so this is where you get the attachment point for a ligament that will attach to a muscle later on. So that is the neutral ligament. Let's say neutral ligament. Neutral ligament, neutral ligament. And let me see if they have that listed as a separate feature on here. They don't. So you'll just, I won't be able to do the pronunciation on here for you. Just say neutral ligament, neutral, neutral ligament, protuberance. Okay. Okay, so that is your external occipital protuberance attachment for the neutral ligament. Now, we have another bump that is labeled on here. Look down here. You're like, okay, what is that? You can feel this. Like, go under your ears. You feel a little bump there. You, 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 you. Feel it bump? we got so many bumps on here. Taking the, the mandible off of Charles here. You know, if you look from the back, so this is the, the view that we're looking at there. Bump, bump. Bump, bump. What is the name of that bump? Sounds like Dr. Seuss. Da, 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 da. Mastoid process. Mastoid process. Mastoid process. Now here's another word in anatomy, process. So a process is something, it's a bone feature that sticks out. So it, it sticks out. So notice that this mastoid process, and if you look from the lateral view, there it is. It's kind of a point, 
not not a, a super point, but it's it's a point and it sticks out from the rest of the skull. So that is a process. So let's uh, let's pronounce this. Mastoid process. Okay. So it's part of, and of course, d the bones themselves have names of different regions. So this is part of the mastoid part of the temporal bone. So it's a feature of the temporal bone itself. And um, it says posterior and inferior to the external acoustic meatus. So I already mentioned to you the acoustic, uh, external acoustic meatus is your ear hole. And notice that the mastoid process is posterior to that and inferior because it's down here. So that is your mastoid process. That's a key feature to know on the skull. Hint, hint, hint. Okay, so um, it's an external conical projection and it has a function. So it's an attachment point for muscles. Most of these features are going to be um, attachment points for something, a muscle or a ligament. So provides attachment for and these different muscles you will learn later, the splenius capitis, the sternocleidomastoid, that's the muscle that goes like this, it allows you to turn your neck, you'll learn that later, and the posterior digastric muscles. So um, again, this is, you can feel it here, and it's an attachment point for muscles. So the sternocleidomastoid is this big muscle that goes down here, and notice part of the name of the muscle is mastoid. That tells you it attaches to the mastoid process. So again, mastoid process. Now, uh, from the posterior view, you can also see part of the mandible. And so if I'm going to have to stick Charles's mandible, his jaw back on here. And so from the posterior aspect, you can see the lower part of the jaw, the lower part of the mandible. And so that's why they have it on here. Just remember that the mandible is actually separate from the rest of the skull. So, so we have the mandible, the temporal bones, a little bit of them viewable, the occipital bone with its external occipital protuberance, the suture, the lambdoid suture that divides uh, the occipital region from the parietal regions, the parietal bones joined together by the sagittal suture, and down here we have the mastoid process of the temporal bones. Now there's one other feature I didn't tell you about yet, and it's these little guys. This is so interesting. Check it out. On Charles, on the cast I have here, this guy along the lambdoid suture actually does not have any of those. It doesn't look like the one that's on AP Revealed. He does not have these little bones. These little bones are called sutural bones, and they're just little bones that sometimes, and some people, um, I should say most people, but not all people, are stuck into those sutures, just little tiny bones. Now this guy does have some sutural bones, but not in the same area where the guy on AP Revealed does. He has a little sutural bone right there. I don't know if you can see it in the camera. And he has one on this side as well. So this is very interesting. You know, when you're reading a textbook, they make it sound like everybody looks exactly the same on the inside. And that's not true. There, just like there's variation on the outside, there's variation on the inside from person to person. People have different numbers of little sutural bones. Their um, arteries and veins might be different. Their muscles could even be slightly different from each other. So we do have a lot of variation coded by variations in our DNA. And this guy happens to have a lot of sutural bones. Not everybody does. But just know, this, know that those little bones along sutures are called sutural bones. So these are in or near the sutures of skulls. Um, they're small isolated bones. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. They're very irregular. Um, and the number varies. That's the important part. The number of these guys varies from zero to a lot, it, depending on the people. Um, and you usually see these most often along this lambdoid suture more than any other place in the body. Some books call these wormian bones, but I like, I like sutural bones. I think that's nicer. Okay, so that's the posterior view. Let's take Charles here and let's flip him over to the lateral view. So we're going to go up here, go to lateral view. Um, notice the muscle attachment points here. So big origin of muscle here on the temporal bone and the parietal and a little bit of the frontal. So basically this lateral aspect, big muscle attaching or uh, attaching here, originating from here. And 
That is because this guy has to be able to support your jaw muscles. We're chewing because we're primates after all, right? And, uh, and a few insertion points here where muscles from other areas are going to insert onto here. Boop, they're going to attach that way. So let's, uh, let's pull this down and let's take a look here. So right off the bat, you can see sutures that you already recognize. So you already, well, you already know your lambdoid suture back there, right? So let's, let's turn on the layers. Okay, so you already know your lambdoid suture. So this is just taking what was here and looking from this perspective. So you, that's your, your uh, lambdoid suture. And what about this bone here? You're like, I know that. That is my occipital bone. You already know that, which makes this my external occipital protuberance. Okay, so you're just, you're just taking what you already know from back here, flipping it around that way. Okay, so you can see a little bit of those structures from the side. And that, of course, would make this your parietal bone from the side. So we're taking what you could see a little bit of here. Now you can see the big part of the bones. So that is your parietal bone. Um, this is, well, down here is your mastoid process, right? You already know that. Okay, so we took what you could see a little bit of here. Burp, now you can see a lot of it. That's your mastoid process. Big feature for muscle attachment. Um, and then up here is the rest of the bone it's attached to, and that is your temporal bone. So all of this is your temporal bone. So you're like, wow, that's actually a funny shaped bone. It includes this little ridge right here, which you can kind of feel as part of your, this part of your cheek, right? Right there. And it goes all the way to here. And so notice that you can outline the bones via the sutures. That's what determines the start and end of a bone. And that comes way out here and does something funky over here. But it includes the mastoid process. So, and lots of different parts to this guy. And of course, there is the ear hole called the external acoustic meatus. And they, they stuck a peg in there for you to look at. But, um, but again, let's just go back to the whole temporal bone there. Now, dividing the temporal bone from the parietal bone and the occipital bone is, of course, another suture. And all sutures have names. So this guy's name is the squamous suture. Let's pronounce that. Squamous suture. And you're like, okay, I thought it was going to be called the temporal suture. No, it's the squamous suture. It, of course, has a name that is different than you would expect. But the reason is because the flat, remember, remember from the cells, remember squamous cells were those flat cells, like squashed? So squamous means flat. And so the temporal bone has a nice, smooth, flat region. You can feel it here, right? Feel that flat region. That's your squamous region of the temporal bone. So squamous part of the temporal bone. And you can see it, it's about the top half of the whole bone. And it extends into this area that forms part of that bridge of your, of your cheekbone. And that has a name we'll go over in a second. So that is your squamous part of your temporal bone. Squamous part, whole temporal bone. Squamous part, whole temporal bone. And so the suture that is around the squamous part is your squamous suture. Makes sense, right? So it's the joint between the squamous portion of the temporal bone and the parietal and occipital bones. Okay, so we already got, we're, we're coming along here. We got external occipital protuberance, lambdoid suture, occipital bone, mastoid process of the temporal bone, the whole temporal bone, the external acoustic meatus inside the uh, temporal bone, the squamous part of the temporal bone, and the squamous suture attached to the parietal bone. And then, of course, now we're ready to move on. Okay, so we know that some of the features of the temporal bone is that it has a mastoid process, and it has a squamous part attached to a squamous suture. But, and we know that it has a, an external acoustic meatus, which is your ear hole. External, it's outside, acoustic for sound, meatus. There's another word. So we've been over the words protuberance, which is a little bump, uh, process, which is kind of a longer quasi-pointy thing, and now we have meatus. So meatus is a hole, kind of a kind of a smallish hole. Okay, that's a meatus. Now we have this other thing coming out here. So we go back to here. So we've We've been through here, okay, so mastoid process, temporal bone, squamous portion of the temporal bone, and squamous suture. 
And now we're going to come out to here, just this part right here of the cheekbone. That right there is called a zygomatic process. Zygomatic, that just sounds so cool. Zygomatic, like the, the software I use to make these films is called Screencast-O-Matic. This is zygomatic. So this is the zygomatic process. So we went over the mastoid process. And remember, process is a little kind of pointy-ish, not super pointy, but pointy-ish projection out here. Well, this is another process. It's another projection. Um, and it's part of what you will call this uh, arch right here, called the zygomatic arch. So this is the zygomatic process but it's attached to the temporal bone. It's coming from the temporal bone, so we say it's the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. So that area right here, not the whole thing, just this part. There's a suture right there um, that separates this part from that part. So let's pronounce this. Zygomatic process of temporal zygomatic bone. Zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Okay, so it is the anterior projection of the squamous temporal bone. Anterior, because it's in the front, it's a projection. It's coming out of the squamous part of the temporal bone. And so it joins the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. We'll get into that later, but that's this thing over here. Um, and it makes the whole thing the zygomatic arch. So this is what gives you your cheekbone shape. So I have rather high cheekbones. It's my zygomatic arch. And the part that makes more the posterior part is my zygomatic process of my temporal bone. All right, I think you guys got that. I think you got that. Okay, moving on up. Oh, what is this little thing down here? We thought we were done. Okay, you got the mastoid process. You got this little thing. It almost looks like an earring hanging down. Look how pointy that is. Dun, 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 dun. That is called a styloid process, and it's on the temporal bone. Styloid process of the temporal bone. So it's another process. It's another pointy projection coming coming out of there. Styloid. Isn't styloid the name of the thing they, like, you know, in the old days with those palm pilots, styloid was the thing that you would write with? Well, so a styloid is, is it actually means column. This is a column, right? This little thing here, and there's one on this side. This is a column. It's the styloid process, and it's part of the temporal bone. So this temporal bone, that's why I was so mad at myself that I forgot to mention it at the beginning because the temporal bone has so many cool features on it. It has the mastoid process. It has the external acoustic meatus. It has the styloid process, and it has the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, all part of this bone plus the squamous region. I mean, this is a busy bone, and it should be a busy bone because there's lots going on around it, right? You got attachment points. You have hearing going on inside there. So lots of things going on. Okay, so the styloid process, it's on the tympanic part of the temporal bone. So we know that the upper part was the squamous portion. The lower part of the bone is called the temporal portion. Okay, um, and this is forming, this little, little styloid process is forming part of this lateral aspect of the skull, which is also called your temples, right? Your temples. And, um, yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? So that is your styloid process of your temporal bone. So that is your styloid process. And if you look down here for the function, it provides attachment for all sorts of things. More muscles, right? These, are, these features are all attachment points for things. So it's providing attachment for muscles you will be learning about later called the styloglossus, the stylopharyngeus, and the stylohyoid muscles. Now I'm not going to get into what those muscles do or where they're found yet because you'll be doing that in the muscle section, but notice stylo, 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 oh, styloid process. Get it, right? You often find that if you know the names of the bones and the bone features, it's easier to learn the names of the muscles that they attach with. So styloid process is going to be an attachment point for three stylo something muscles. Got it? So who'd have thunk it, right? These little skinny things. I mean, it looks like you just break them off. Those are attachment points for three different muscles, very important muscles. 
How cool is that? Okay, so that's your styloid process of your temporal bone. So from the lateral aspect, we've been over the main features we need to know of the temporal bone. Mastoid process, external acoustic meatus, styloid process, squamous region, squamous suture, and the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Busy bone. Busy, 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 busy bone. All right, so occipital, parietal, temporal, moving on up. Well, remember we said the front bone here is called your frontal bone, and you'll remember frontal plane had another name. It was also called the coronal plane. You remember that? Well, lo and behold, there's a suture that divides your parietal bones from your frontal bone, and it's called the coronal suture. Coronal plane, coronal means crown. So, you know, this is like the crown of your head. So coronal suture passes through the coronal plane, also called the frontal plane, and hence we have the frontal region made up of the frontal bone. Um, and so you can see that the frontal bones are going to form your forehead, the roof of your orbis, that means, you know, the, the holes where your eyes are, and most of the anterior cranial fossa. Anterior cranial fossa. Another word there, fossa. So a fossa is a shallow depression. And you will see that word fossa all over again. So let's go back over our vocab here. Protuberance is a bump. Process is a pointy projection. Um, fossa is a shallow depression. Meatus is a kind of a hole. Okay. Um, notice that your frontal bones also contain frontal air sinuses. So we'll be looking at the different sinuses of the skull in a little while, and those sinuses are formed by the shapes of the bones. And of course, if you're like me, like right now, getting those, those pockets that are formed by those bones, those sinuses, getting those blocked up, not fun, no good. So where is the sphenoid bone that the frontal bone is articulating with? Well, here it is. This is part of the sphenoid bone, um, the sphenoid bone, and bleh, and that is the greater wing portion of the sphenoid bone. So recall from the video, the sphenoid bone is a butterfly-shaped bone, and so you're kind of looking at the top wing of the butterfly here. So this is the greater wing of the sphenoid bone, and it's articulating with the frontal bone here. Now, where does it articulate? So check this out. Here's just a little tiny region. It's kind of like, you know how like Tennessee and Virginia and West Virginia all come together and there's a little region there called like the tri-state tri area? Well, it's kind of like here, like this is, this is a region where we're actually getting four bones all coming together at the same time. You're getting the temporal bone, the parietal, the frontal, and the greater wing of the sphenoid all coming together in this region. So this region is called the Tarian region. Paterian? No, Tarian, even though it starts with a P. Let's pronounce that. Tarian. Now, ter, P-T-E-R, means wing. Huh, like a pterodactyl? It's a pterodactyl. So, ter means wing, and that makes sense because it's located next to the greater wing of the sphenoid. See, these things are actually, when they were naming these things, some body sometimes had some logical reasons for naming things the way they are. Okay, so we're coming along. We're, we're actually getting close to the spatial region here, but let's, let's go ahead and go over these. So bone, da, 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 frontal bone, separating the frontal bone from the next bone. The suture going down through the coronal plane is the coronal suture. Going down here, parietal bone, separating the parietal bone from the bone back here is the lambdoid suture. This bone, occipital bone. This little bump, external occipital protuberance, and separating this bone and that bone from this bone, <laughs> this is your squamous suture, and this bone is the temporal bone, and the upper part of it is the squamous portion. Down here we have your mastoid process, your external acoustic meatus, and a projection, well, a projection down here called the styloid process and a projection over here called the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. So let's go back over that with Charles here. Frontal bone, coronal suture, 
parietal bone, temporal bone, squamous suture, squamous portion of the temporal bone, mastoid process, styloid process, zygomatic process. So zygomatic process of the temporal bone, mastoid process of the temporal bone, styloid process of the temporal bone, external acoustic meatus, occipital bone, lambdoid suture, external occipital protuberance. All right, I think we got those portions pretty down pat. Let's move on down. Okay, oh, and we forgot to mention this one. So the other thing you can see from the lateral aspect is the portion of the sphenoid bone called the greater wing. So greater wing of the sphenoid bone, and it attaches to these other four bones, or these other three bones, via a region called the terian. So terian, frontal bone, parietal bone, temporal bone, greater wing of the sphenoid. Okay, you guys are doing great. All right, so let's move on down. Um, let's move on down to this area right here. So we already know the temporal process of the temporal bone, but it articulates, ah, oh, that's a word, articulates, that means joins. So the zygomatic process of the temporal bone joins to another process. And that process is attached to a bone on the face. And so that is the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. <laughs> like, uh huh? <laughs> okay, temporal bone with the zygomatic process coming off of it. Now we have a zygomatic bone with a temporal process coming after it. So basically the name of the process is named for the bone that it articulates to. Okay, so this is your zygomatic bone. That's your main cheekbone. And it has a process coming off of it called the temporal process because it articulates with the temporal bone. So it's the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. Temporal process of zygomatic okay. bone. So it's articulating. So the temporal process of the zygomatic bone is articulating with the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Got it? How crazy is that? And together, those two processes, the zygomatic process of the temporal bone and the temporal process of the zygomatic bone, together they form the zygomatic arch. And everybody knows your arches here, right? So that's your zygomatic arch, temporal process of the zygomatic bone, zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Ah, got it? Okay, so that's your zygomatic bone right there. So it makes up the front of your cheeks. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Notice it also makes up part of your orbital. So your zygomatic bone is a paired irregular shaped bone, paired because there's one on each side, and it has the temporal process that contributes to the zygomatic arch. So this is also known as your cheekbone and forms part of the floor and lateral wall of the orbit. So you can see here is your orbit and it's forming part of the lateral and floor of that. Okay, under your cheekbone, you get to the upper part of your jaw here, and that is called your maxilla. Maxilla, you have two of them, one on each side. One on each side. You will take a look at it from the anterior aspect, but that is your maxilla. So it's paired because you got one on each side, irregular shaped, and that, when they come together, forms your upper jaw. Okay, and it has little sockets in it for your teeth. So, so this is. This is his maxilla on one side, maxilla on the other side. There's actually a faint suture between them in some people where they came together, and it contains alveoli pockets for your teeth. And he actually is, has all his upper teeth intact. Now, you'll come up, you'll run into that word alveoli again, like in the lungs. So kind of means a pocket. Um, and then it also contains some air sinuses. So this guy, you know that you get, when you get a sinus infection, you get kind of blocked up here. And that's because the depressions that are here help form a sinus, a cavity that will 
be able to get blocked up and inflamed and, and make you feel really crappy. Okay, what else can you see from this lateral aspect up here? What is that? Huh. Okay, you know this is your nasal region, right? I mean, you know that, right? That's where, that's where your nose goes. That's your nasal region. And so when you look from the side, you get a point here. Another thing sticking out. And it's in the front, so it's anterior. It's in the nasal region, so it's nasal. And it's a spine, because a spine, you usually think of something as pointy, right? Like a spine, something sticking out. So it, this is a process, but it's not called a process. It's called a spine. Like anything that sticks out, things are going to attach to here. And so actually you're going to have some of your facial muscles attach here, your nasalis muscle, which you'll learn about later, and your depressor septi. So these are muscles that are kind of helpful. No, go like this. Okay, so the, that's an attachment point for muscles. So it's important to know. And so it is your anterior nasal spine. Anterior nasal All spine. Right. And what do we have here? That is in the nasal region, and it's your nasal bone. Easy enough, right? So it's paired. you got one on each side. So nasal bone, nasal bone. And, um, you know, it's a small paired bone, and it articulates with the mid midline of the nasal bone from the opposite side, meaning, you know, they're, they're joined together right down the middle. So this is the bridge of your nose. This is right here. My husband's always commenting on the bridge of my nose for some reason. He thinks I have an interesting bridge of my nose. Um, but this is the bony, part of the bony part of your nose. A lot of your nose is cartilage, right? So, um, so that's there. Now, all of this, the orbit, the orbit, your eye sockets. This is also a very busy place. There are a lot of bones that come together, little bones or little parts of bones that come together to make up your orbits. So... We're going to go over these extensively from all points of view, but people get really crazy studying orbits. But if you can remember what bones you'll be able to see from what angle, it'll help. So let's, let's see if we can start clicking on some of those. So you already know that this is your frontal bone. That frontal bone is going to continue down and actually meet up with the nasal bone and meet up with the orbit. So the frontal bone is forming the superior part of the orbit. Okay, so that's your whole orbit right there. The top part is still part of your frontal bone. And what do we have here? Remember that other weird bone that was named in the video called the ethmoid bone? Ethmoid bone. Sounds like you have a lisp. Ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone is actually a very important bone. It is going to have features where, like, the uh, casing around your brain attaches to. That's pretty important. Um, so anyway, we're going to spend a lot more time on the ethmoid bone by itself, but notice that part of the ethmoid bone is going to form part of your skull orbit, so the orbit for the eye. And unfortunately, in this cast, it's kind of weird because it doesn't, it's plastic, and so it's hard to see some of the suture lines, but just know that basically part of the inside of the orbit is going to be the ethmoid bone. So um, this particular part of the ethmoid bone that's forming that part of the, of the orbit is called the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone. Orbital plate of ethmoid bone. So it's bone. forming part of the medial wall of the orbit. So remember medial means towards the middle. And so this is forming part of the medial wall of the orbit. Okay, so it's thin walled, smooth lateral surface of the ethmoid forms a large part of the medial wall of the orbit, covers the middle and posterior ethmoid air cells, means it's kind of forming part of the sinuses. Um, some books call this little feature the lamina papyracea, but don't worry about that. We will call it the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone. So medial wall of the orbit is formed by the orbit plate of the ethmoid, as well as uh, the frontal orbital surface and the lacrimal bones and the lesser ring of the sphenoid. So we're going to go over all these other parts of the orbit right here, but towards kind of the posterior part, making up the largest portion of all the bones in the medial wall of the orbit. That is your orbital plate of your ethmoid bone. Okay, but moving more anteriorly to that, we have another little bone here, and this is your lacrimal bone. So lacrima means tears, and so 
this lacrimal bone is next to your tear ducts because that's where your tears come out. And so let's see if we can find the lacrimal bone on here. So this lacrimal bone is going to actually contain your tear ducts. Can you see that? I don't know if you can see that. That's your lacrimal bone. They're, they're little bones. They're little bones. Um, so it's location. It's inside the orbit, anterior and medial. So it's on the medial wall. And it's kind of forming part of the nasal cavity, the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Smallest and most delicate bones of the skull. These are little itty bitty things and they're very fragile, they're very thin. Um, and its orbital surface contributes to the fossa for the lacrimal sac and the nasal lacrimal groove. So notice that your, your lacrimal groove, your tear ducts, are located right next to your nasal cavity. So we notice like when you cry, you get all stuffed up, it's all joined together. So it's a fossa, there's another, there's that word again, fossa is a shallow depression. So this creates a little bit of a depression and um, the nasal surface, so over here, is contributing to the middle nasal concha, which we'll get into a little bit. So um, anyway, the point is this lacrimal bone here forms part of the orbit on the medial side, and it's going to also be responsible for forming um, a space for the lacrimal sac, which will help to make your tear ducts. Okay, so this little space here, notice they put a peg, it's a hole. So you can see that, see the hole? Okay, so this is the fossa, the depression for the lacrimal sac. So it's between the lacrimal bone and the frontal process of the maxilla. So here's your maxilla, and here's the frontal process of your maxilla. So let's take this maxilla, and it comes up here, making your frontal process, and then the lacrimal bone. So the lacrimal bone and the frontal process of the maxilla create your tear ducts, right? Your lacrimal sacs, or your lacrimal grooves, however you want to look at it. So the fossa for the lacrimal sac is a shallow depression that contains the lacry lacrimal sac. And uh, anyway, it collects lacrimal tear fluid from the lacrimal canaliculi, canals, little canals. And it's continuous inferiorly with the nasolacrimal duct that leads to the interior inferior nasal. So in other words, your tear ducts go meet up with your nasal cavity, but this depression here is what allows for tears to go through there. Okay, so it's made up by the lacrimal bone and this frontal process of the maxilla. Oh, wow. Okay, let's go back over what we've done so far before we get to the mandible. So we got nasal bone. We got the anterior nasal spine, the maxilla with the frontal process, the fossa, depression for the lacrimal sac, lacrimal bone, the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone, the whole orbit, which includes part of the frontal bone, coronal suture, pterian, greater wing of the sphenoid, parietal, squamous suture, squamous part of the temporal bone, temporal bone, mastoid process, styloid process, external acoustic meatus, zygomatic process of the temporal bone, temporal process of the zygomatic bone, did I already say zygomatic? Zygomatic bone, lambdoid suture, occipital bone, external occipital protuberance. Now the only other thing we need to study on the lateral aspect is the features of the mandible, the lower jaw. Now I'm going to get back out his jaw here. And of course, what do you have in your jaw? You have teeth. So the upper ones are your maxillary teeth and the ones on the bottom are your mandibular teeth because the mandibular teeth are connected to the mandible or is the maxillary teeth are connected to the maxilla. What else do we got here? Oh, look at this. So they stuck pegs in it. Little holes. You can feel them. Go like this. Feel little holes. Check it out. Little holes. Those little holes are called mental foramina. Mental. Remember I told you pay attention to the term mental region? So when we're saying mental, we're talking about the region of the chin. Foramen, or foramina, plural, 
are little holes. And you see that term, that's another term. So we got protuberance, we got fossa, we got process, we have meatus. Now we have foramen or foramina. Those are foramina or holes. And these holes allow blood vessels and nerves to pass through. And so these are some very important foramina here, the mental foramina. Um, very important blood vessels and nerves pass through those holes right there. And so you can see that right here. So those are your mental foramina. And it's so cool, like any vertebrate skull you pick up, you pick up the skull of a cat, you pick up the skull of a frog, you pick up the skull of a horse, whatever it is. I mean, all these features that you see in the human are in those animals too. They're just, you know, might look a little different depending on, you know, the shape of the skull. So you can find those holes in all sorts of creatures. Okay, so the front of the mandible is called the body of the mandible. Okay, so this is the front part of the lower jaw, horizontal part of the mandible, and this is what contains the alveoli, the sockets for the teeth. Okay, so this is the body of the mandible. And then here's your whole mandible right here. Okay, so that's your, your lower jaw. The upper part of the mandible is called the ramus. Ramus so of that's mandible. The vertical part of the mandible. So ramus, body. Ramus, the mandible, body of the mandible. Okay, and again, all these things are attachment points. So this is going to have attachment for some very strong, important muscles. Temporalis muscle, which is involved in chewing. Masseter is involved in chewing. And medial pterygoid muscles. Pter, you already know, means wing. So again, we're going to learn these muscles later, but just know that a lot of these muscles are going to attach to the um, vertical part of the jaw, which is called the ramus of the jaw, or ramus of the mandible. Here is the body of the mandible, so going back to the body, you know, this is, uh, think of the body of the mandible, key thing, has the sockets for the mandibular teeth, has the alveoli, and it has the mental foramina. The ramus is very important for jaw muscles to attach so that you can go and chew, right? Now, notice when you get to the top of the mandible, it has little processes here. So right there, this is your coronoid process of the mandible. So it's the one that's anterior, coronoid process of the mandible. Okay, so this one's very pointy. So one's not so pointy, the other one's very pointy. Okay, it's anterior and superior aspect of the ramus. Okay, so let's, let's look at what we want to say about this guy. So this is actually where the temporalis muscle will attach. Very important jaw muscle will attach to this process. So again, most features of bones that stick out are for muscle attachment. Okay, so that's the attachment for t the temporalis muscle. This is called the coronoid process. Coronoid kind of refers to crown also. So this is a coronoid process. Now, if we come back here, we're at the condylar process. Condylar process of mandible. Condylar process of the mandible is back here. So coronoid process, condylar process. Coronoid process, condylar process. Coronoid, condylar. Coronoid, condylar. And so the condylar process is going to allow a muscle called the lateral pterygoid muscle to attach. So the temporalis muscle attaches to the coronoid, the lateral pterygoid attaches to the condylar process. Okay, so it's superior projection from the posterior aspect of the ramus. And now notice how the, the top of it here, we call the apical side, remember when we were talking about cells, the top of the cell is called the apical part of the cell. So the apical part of the condylar process is flat. It forms a head. Okay, so let's click on that. He's right here. So this is your head of your mandible, but it's part of your condylar process. Um, and so this is important that it's flat. So there's a reason and a rhyme for everything. Why is the head that's attached to the condylar process attached to the ramus of the jaw of the mandible, why is it flat? Well, when we stick this guy back together, notice how it fits right into this little groove right there. How convenient is that, right? And that allows you to chomp. Okay, so just imagine, if this thing was pointy, 
like the coronoid process was, this wouldn't fit nice, right? And we wouldn't be able to move our jaw properly. So everything's evolved for a reason. I mean, how cool is that? Okay, so, so notice that it articulates with the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. And you're like, wait a minute. Okay, now there's another feature of the temporal bone I have to learn. Why, yes, of course. But we couldn't really see it from the lateral aspect, so I didn't really talk to you about it yet. But if we take your temporal bone, turn this way, there's a nice little spot right there, a nice little depression, a little groove, and that is called your mandibular fossa. Mandibular fossa. Because remember, a lot of times these features are named for the bones they articulate with. So mandibular, I mean it's going to articulate with the mandible, fossa, it's a depression, and that depression is there because of the head of the condylar process. It needs to fit right into that spot right there. See that? How perfect is that? He likes it. Okay, so the head of the condibular, condylar process of the ramus of the mandible articulates with the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. Booyah! See if you can talk about that at a party. Let's say that again. The temporal process contains the mandibular fossa on the inferior side that articulates with the head of the condylar process of the ramus of the mandible. Try practicing that five times fast. Okay, now one other thing to go over here. Boom. Look at that. Every little part of bones has a name. Notice this little, okay, you got your condylar process and you got your coronoid process. Well, together they form a little, little notch here, and that is called the mandibular notch. That is your mandibular notch because it's on the mandible and it's a notch. Yet another word to add to your vocab list, notch. You see also your body, and here's one of them. So that is your mandibular notch. So it's between the condylar and the coronoid processes. It's very broad. It's on the superior border of the ramus of the mandible. Okay, let's go back over that jaw one more time. This process here, it's interior, so it's the coronoid process. We have back here, condylar process with the condylar head that articulates to the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. We have your mandibular notch. This whole vertical region is called the ramus of the mandible. The whole mandible is outlined there in the lateral aspect. The front part here is the body of the mandible and it contains alveoli for the mandibular teeth. And here's your mental foramina that, um, you know, artery, vein, and nerve pass through. And those would be called the mental artery, mental vein, and mental nerve. So keep that in mind for when we get to those units. That is the lateral aspect of the skull. Does your head hurt yet? Let's go ahead and change it up. So we've been through the anterior and the lateral, and the well, I'm sorry, we've been through the posterior and the lateral. Let's take a quick look from the superior. That's easy, right? So superior looking this way. Actually, you guys are looking that way. Um, and so, obviously, you're going to be able to see the sagittal suture very well. So let's go here to your sagittal suture, separating your parietal bones. Here's your frontal bone up here, and you'll remember the coronal suture goes between it. Here's your occipital bone back here, separated by um, your lambdoid suture, and in some people, these little sutural bones. So that's all you can see from the superior view, the parietals, the occipital, the frontal, and the sutures between them. Okay, that was easy. <laughs> Don't you wish it was also easy? Um, not so easy. <laughs> Let's go to the anterior part here. So notice the muscle attachment points. Let's pull those off and label this baby. Okay, so you already know the frontal bone, easy enough. But did you know that the frontal bone has features as well that we need to learn? So touch right here in the middle of your frontal bone. I love the name of this. I mean, it just rolls off the tongue. That is your glabella. Sounds very Italian. Glabella. Glabella. So that's this little depression. Some have a bigger depression there than others, but that's your glabella. Okay, so it's flattened, raised area on the external surface. Usually kind of more pronounced in men than women, but I, I have a little bit of a glabella there. Um, and what else do we got here? So remember, I talked to you about notches. So we were talking about the mandibular notch. And I mentioned that there's another notch that not all, but most people have right on the superior 
part of their orbit, which is part of the frontal bone. And that's called your supraorbital notch. Now here is what's cool. So Charles here has supraorbital notches. So there's one right there, and there's one right there. Cool enough, right? But get this. Some people, instead of a notch, have a hole, in which case it's called a supraorbital foramen. Or if he has two, or she, it would be a supraorbital foramina. That means that instead of a notch, the bone actually finished in closing to form a hole. Again, it's amazing how much variation there is from person to person. So they stuck a peg here and a peg here just to point out these are the supraorbital notches, but they're part of that frontal bone. And then what do we have here? So notice, feel your eyebrows. There's bump there making up your eyebrows. It's not just hair. So you actually have an area for those eyebrows. And so that is called the superciliary arch. Super means it's, it's superior aspect, right? Superciliary. Well, what does that sound like? Remember cilia? It refers to little hairs. So superciliary means above the hairs. And it's an arch, right? So go like this, superciliary arch. And this guy has really big superciliary arches. Superciliary arch, superciliary arch. So superciliary arch, supraorbital notch, or in some people, foramina, frontal bone, glabella. What else do we have here? Let's see. There's your coronal suture, and there's your parietal bones. You already know that. Don't need to go over that. There's your terion. You already know that and your temporal bones, you already know that. So see, once you know the bones from one aspect, it's not so hard to learn them from the other aspects. And these, of course, are your zygomatic bones right here. Okay, so you know those, and you know that there's a temporal process coming off that zygomatic bone. Let's go down to the mandible here. So you already know your mandibular teeth and your maxillary teeth. Okay, so maxillary teeth come off the maxilla, mandibular teeth come off the mandible. Um, and here's your mental foramina. Now, check that little bump out. You can feel it, some more than others. So notice there's a bump at the tip of your chin. It's a bump, kind of like your external occipital protuberance was a bump. This is your mental protuberance because it's in your mental region. Remember I said be, pay attention to that mental region when we we're going over regional terms because it explains the bones, and even some muscle that's out there. So, so that is your mental protuberance. So it's triangular, it's raised, it's at the midline of the chin, it's on the mandible, and it relates to the prominence of the chin, which is actually genetically coded. That turns out that's a Mendelian trait. So some people have really prominent chins, some people have less prominent chins. How prominent your chin is depends on how prominent your mental protuberance is. Crazy, huh? So, and then all of this, of course, is your mandible. Um, okay, so here are your maxilla. And again, they're, they're fused bones. There's actually two bones there. Now, come up to your maxilla and feel right here. You'll feel holes. There are holes there, too. Foramina, right? There they are with pegs sticking into them. Here are his foramina here. So these are the infra orbital foramina. Infra, in this case, kind of refers to below, kind of like inferior, below the orbital. So infra orbital means below the orbital, and they're holes, foramina. So these are for um, nerves, arteries, and veins to pass through, specifically the infraorbital <laughs> nerve, artery, and veins. So you have mental foramina, infraorbital foramina. Mental foramina, infraorbital foramina. How cool is that? So obviously, you have to be able, be able to supply your face with blood and with nerves to move and twitch your muscles. And so you're going to have to have places for those vessels and the nerves to pass through. And so you have holes here. Again, look at a skull of any vertebrate animal, and you will find those there. Now, moving on up. So here are your nasal bones. Notice that this guy has nice suture there between his nasal bones. So that's the, those are the nasal bones right there, making up the hard, bony part of the nasal region. 
Now, this is interesting when you get down into the nasal cavity. Notice that there is the strange flat bone it's kind of bisecting that nasal cavity. There, this is actually made up of several bones. So this little bone down here, which you might remember from the video, is actually kind of a flat, strange shaped bone. I'll, I'll see if we can look at that by itself later. Um, that is called the vomer. And so it makes up the lower midline of the nasal cavity. Plow-shaped bone, yeah, because it's kind of like this. And when you turn it this way, all you're seeing is the edge of it. Now, we're starting, when you get into the nasal cavity and orbitals, you're starting to get into those little bones that, to really see the whole bone, you have to disarticulate the skull. That means break the bones apart from each other at the sutures. And so you can actually buy whole disarticulated skulls online. They're kind of expensive, and we don't even have any right now in our lab at the time of this recording. I'm hoping that will change. Um, and so it's kind of hard to see those bones by themselves. But the nice thing about AP Revealed is it'll allow us to actually look at those bones individually, which we will in a few minutes. But that is your vomer. And attached to the vomer superiorly is part of that ethmoid bone. So notice that ethmoid bone and this ethmoid and sphenoid. Those are the coolest little bones because they are found in so many different parts of the skull. You know, just they're sitting in the middle of the skull, and so you see parts of them no matter what angle you're turning the skull at. So notice part of the ethmoid bone is making up the top midline of the nasal cavity, and of course part of it, as we already said, is making up the medial wall of the orbitals. So it's <laughs> when they say irregular shaped bone, they aren't kidding. The ethmoid is the craziest looking bone you've ever seen but it has really, really important features on it, like the cribiform plate, the cristigali, and the perpendicular plate, and we will go over all of those. So, um, but the part that we're looking at right now is the part that contributes to the superior part of the nasal cavity. Um, and it's a very light bone, it has lots of spaces, and so it's making up part of your sinuses. So you actually have sinuses called ethmoid sinuses. Now over here on the side, called the inferior nasal concha. Inferior nasal concha. So what allows air to pass through your nose and kind of become warmed before it continues on its way are these concha. Think of like a conch shell has like all these little curly cues that allow the air to go through and that's why when you listen to a conch shell or a conch depending on where you're from it sounds like the ocean, right? It's because of the air passing through. Well we have that same idea in our noses. You have these Con conche or conca for short and we have uh, superior middle and, and inferior ones so it's a shelf-like projection of bone it's covered by thick mucosa right there's mucus there to trap ickies and, and help warm the thing and they're articulating with the ethmoid bone so it's increasing surface area for the nasal cavity warming filtering and humidifying the air and so the superior and middle nasal concha are part of the ethmoid bone, while this inferior nasal concha is actually a separate bone. So the inferior is a separate bone. The superior and middle, which we haven't gone over yet, are part of the ethmoid bone. And so if we click here, you're seeing part of the middle nasal concha, which is part of the ethmoid bone. But this is the inferior, which is a separate bone. Whew. Okay, so let's one more time review what we see on the anterior aspect of the skull. Frontal bone, parietal bone, temporal bone, terian region, supraorbital notch, glabella, superciliary notch, nasal bones, orbits, zygomatic bones, inferior nasal concha, vomer, ethmoid bone, which also reaches up there, lacrimal bones, middle nasal concha, which is part of the ethmoid bone, infraorbital foramina, maxilla, mental foramina, mandibular teeth, maxillary teeth, mental protuberance, and your whole mandible. Whew. So now you know the lateral aspect of the skull, the anterior aspect of the skull, and the posterior aspect of the skull. You are doing great. <laughs>